So, in this video lecture, I want to talk about two significant World War I poets uh, who are very much in contrast to one another. Uh, I'm going to talk about Rupert Brooke and Siegfried Sassoon. Um, so, the, the Rupert Brooke poem that I asked you guys to read for this week is The Soldier on 2019. Uh, and then I asked you guys to read two Sassoon poems. The Rear Guard and the General, uh, 2024 through 2025. Um, so these two poets are a good contrast to one another because they represent two very different approaches to World War I poetry. Uh, Rupert Brooke is very much an early war poet coming out of um, an Edwardian and a Georgian tradition of sort of pastoralism and noble ideas and things like this, and there's this sort of romantic romantic sense of the world, romantic sense of the combat and the soldier and things like this. And so he gives us this Petrarchan sonnet in 1914 called The Soldier, and um, the sort of key idea of this sonnet is this very sort of romantic notion that the death of the soldier hollows the ground on which he died for his country. So, um, very, I mean, this, this is a really famous first stanza. If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. There shall be in that rich earth a richer dust concealed. So there's this idea that by dying for one's country, by dying in war, one is adding to sort of this, the national stock of the country, one is adding to the national sort of glory, but also that one is doing something honorable and doing something worthwhile. And this is tied very much to uh, Brooks' sort of earlier uh, interest in the pastoral or in nature imagery. And we get here in stanza two, a dust whom England bore, shaped, made aware, gave once her flowers to love, her ways to roam, a body of England's breathing English air, washed by the rivers, blessed by sons of home. So we have here again this sort of, this this major interest in nature as a, a force that shapes the poet. Um, so English flowers, English air, English rivers, the English sun. Um, and there's this, there's this sense that the soldier's identity is subsumed in the national identity. So the soldier is not for himself. The soldier is not an individual. The soldier is a representative of his country and the glory of his country. This is very much in contrast to Siegfried Sassoon, who is much darker and who is much more sort of brutally ironic about the war. Um, so Sassoon is Sassoon's work is characteristic of the late war poets, um, 1916, 17, and 18. Um, people, who, uh, people who wrote much darker poetry, much rougher poetry, and much angrier poetry. And so one thing that we get in a poem like The Rear Guard is we get this... Uh, We, well, we no longer have this romanticization of soldiers the way that we have in Brooks' poem. Um, so we take, for instance, line 21. S uh, Sassoon describes these soldiers living in the trench as dazed, muttering creatures underground. There's no longer this sense that to be a soldier and to go out and go to the war is somehow a glorious thing to do for England. It is dirty. It is... Uh, it is terrifying, it's horrific, 
And we see this sort of horrific callousness, this brutality, in the second stanza of the rearguard, where uh, the poet talks about uh, the poet talks about a messenger coming through the trenches and seeing someone he thinks is sleeping, uh, and kicking that that body when it refuses to answer, only to roll the the body over and realize it's a corpse. Uh, he says. Uh, he says, uh, so we've got first here, uh, line, line 13, which is a quote, and then we go into the sort of description again. Get up and guide me through this stinking place. Savage, he kicked a soft, unanswering heap, and flashed his beam across the livid face, terribly glaring up, whose eyes yet wore agony, dying hard ten days before, and fists of fingers clutched a blackening wound. So, we've got this, like, really ghastly, morbid image here of this corpse who's been in the trench for ten days since he died, and, and this messenger, this, this guy presumably bringing orders, doesn't even recognize it as a corpse. So there's, there's this sense that to be in the trenches is to be already dead. Like, to be in this horrible place is not romantic, is not idyllic, idyllic, is not glorious or honorable, that there's no difference between the living and the dead in this horrible space. Um, but, iron like, it's, it's, again, this sort of ironic satire that Sassoon brings to his poetry um, that makes these critiques of the war so uh, so effective, and we get this we get this irony more sort of apparently in the poem The General, and the reason we get such a brutal ironic uh, commentary in this is because the poem is upbeat. So, I mean, the poem has a regular rhyme scheme, A, B, A, B, C, C, C. It has, um, <coughs> it has a, a, a bouncy rhythm, even as it's talking about all of these soldiers going to their death. So we've got, Good morning, good morning, the general said when we met him last week on our way to the line. Now the soldiers he smiled at are most of them dead, and were cursing his staff for incompetent swine. He's a cheery old cart, grunted Harry to Jack, as they slogged up to Eris with rifle and pack. But he did for them both by his plan of attack. So, we've got... This is, I think, a really brilliant poem, because it's upbeat. It's got a, it's got a tempo that's pleasant and bouncy and light. But it's talking about the murder of these soldiers, basically, by this in this suicidal attack, and this is this is a technique that's characteristic of modernist and postmodernist literature. This sort of way of this sort of disjunction between tone, style, and subject matter, which and disorienting and and uh, I mean basically the idea is to shock the reader out of their complacency here and so in Sassoon we get again this very morbid poetry very uh, brutally ironic approach which is very much different than what we get in Rupert Brooke's early war poem, which again has these sort of romantic ideals about combat and this sort of glorious gesture of dying for one's country um, that characterizes these sort of older uh, pre-World War I poetic traditions.